Hello, America. Um, we have a lot to get to today. Uh, I want to start here, Muslim Brotherhood, their infiltration in Congress. But I want to start with something that's being misreported today. Uh, people are saying this happened over the weekend in Chicago. It was actually a few weeks ago. Freshman Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib opened her keynote speech at the Council on American Islamic Relations, 15th annual banquet. I want to start with what she said at the very beginning. You know, we always said the Muslims are coming. Well, guess what? I think we're here. We're not only everywhere in all kinds of different governments, but mashallah, wow, we're in the United States Congress. Okay. If you get your information from the mainstream propaganda, otherwise known as mainstream media, that statement just means there's more diversity in Congress, and it might. If you didn't know who CARE actually is, why CARE was actually founded, and by whom, the statement takes on a completely different context once you know those things. So I want to start off by talking about something else, but I'm going to come back to that, and it's really important because they tie together. But first, let me talk to you about freshman congresswoman, another one, Ilan Omar. Now, we first started looking into congresswoman Omar's um, uh, life, and we were, we were just trying to make sense of her anti-Semitism, which the left doesn't seem to have a problem with. Why does the left, by and large, and the media, give her a pass? Okay. They hate the right, they think Donald Trump's horrible. Sure, but there's more. A journey into the life of Omar uncovered a very strange history of the media giving a pass to multiple really suspicious stories that they would never in a million years look the other way for anyone else. Tonight's show is separated in two parts. The second half takes a deep dive and provides context into what Rashid Tlaib uh, said and what she really meant with the Muslims are coming and we're already inside governments and the U.S. Congress. That ties back to our second congresswoman. However, on this first part, this first segment, I want to warn you that what I'm about to talk about so far is unverified. But that is the problem. Why is it still unverified? Why isn't the media in a full-out blitz to investigate some of these stories? Because we're talking about immigration fraud, committing perjury, and cam campaign finance and ethics violations. Why is no one looking further into a freshman congresswoman who's accused of that, beside her anti-Semitism? She, she, she seems almost completely immune to negative press and from mainstream media, and we've seen it before. Take, for instance, the story that came out from online bloggers. Now, this happened in 2016. The bloggers claimed that Omar had committed immigration fraud by marrying her brother to facilitate his arrival in the United States. Okay, first of all, it's coming from an online blogger. Sometimes they're right. Most times they're really, really wrong. I don't know. Well, directly after the information hit the Internet, Omar set her uh, social media platforms to private, then deleted all of the alleged evidence used to prove the immigration and fraud case. Okay, sounds fishy, but I don't know. Mainstream media would not touch it. Not even the local Minnesota media would touch it. Then the Associated Press grew a set, and they were the only outlet to actually do a little digging. But when they asked Omar what was going on, she just responded with saying the allegations were lies. She said, and I quote, we choose not to further the narrative of those who oppose us. Okay, all right, but if all of these are lies, it would be really easy to prove them so. So the AP asked Omar for the immigration records and birth certificates that would prove her denial. But she refused to cooperate. Mm. Is this like Barack Obama and the birth certificate thing? Not exactly. She stated that her family's birth certificates were lost during the Somali Civil War. Could be, sounds reasonable, I don't know, but that's what she said. But the immigration records, if that was true, why would you refuse to um, make available your immigration records? Why not offer those up? Well, a Freedom of Information Act requested 
uh, by the AP and submitted by the Associated Press was sent back, explaining the approval to the release would have to be authorized by Omar and her husband or brother or whomever. They obviously never signed off on it. Even Snopes, who aren't exactly considered friends of conservatives, are classifying this case as unproven. So let me recap. What we have here is a credible case of immigration fraud by a sitting U.S. representative, and the alleged perpetrator has deleted visual evidence, refuses to provide evidence that could exonerate her by a credible source, the Associated Press, and then has gone radio silent on the issue ever since. How is this not sticking in some journalist's craw? At the very least, you'd think someone, New York Times, Washington Post, would be all over this. No, not really, but you know what I'm saying. At the very most, why wouldn't the government open up a probe? As per the Associated Press, the Obama administration never started an investigation, and the Trump administration so far has refused to comment. But wait, that's not all there is. There is also this evidence that Ilan Omar committed perjury in court. This one we can prove. She filed for a divorce in 2017. Omar claimed that she hadn't seen or made contact with her husband or brother since 2011. Let's just say he is a husband and not a brother. Watch for perjury. She said she hadn't seen him under oath since 2011. She said, I don't know where he is, possibly maybe someplace in London. Well, we have a document obtained by PJ Media from the Minnesota Family Court Record Center. It verifies right here that Omar officially submitted to the court that her last contact with her husband was in June 2011. So, in the absence of journalists doing any journalisming, the internet, internet sleuths have to go to work. Well, they used Omar's husband's last lo known location, London, and searched to see if Omar had traveled there between 2011 and 2016. Well, they found some evidence. They found these pictures on a social media, taken in London back in 2014. And if you look, you will notice that's Omar and her ex-husband, or brother, or whomever. That's weird. So again, there's pretty strong case for law enforcement to open a perjury investigation at the very least. Mainstream media should do some more digging. Give pre credit where credit is due to the Associated Press. They are the only ones that at least asked Omar's camp about the discrepancy. You can imagine how Omar responded. She refused to address the situation and Omar's ex-husband won't respond. And the pictures, mm, they're no longer available. But wait, there's more. Last year, Ilan Omar was accused by state representative Steve Draskowski of not one, but three campaign finance and ethics violations. The first allegation involves the use of $3,000 in campaign money that was spent on travel to Estonia and Boston. Draskowski claims that these trips were personal in nature. Her response, quote, it should be concerning to his constituents that he's using taxpayer dollars to harass a Muslim candidate. In other words, her defense is, I'm a Muslim. Pretty solid in today's world, but it doesn't fly with me. The second allegation is Omar used $2,000 in campaign funds to pay her lawyer for divorce proceeding. Her response, no, it was for something else. No other explanation was given. The third allegation was that she made ethics violations after accepting speaking fees from public colleges. Omar would later pay that money back. Now, if you were caught violating ethics standards to get rich, you'd kind of expect you to give back the money and, you know, okay, I promise, or sorry, we're not going to break the law again, blah, 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 blah. But this is what we got instead. Quote, we recognize how these folks are deeply invested in stopping a progressive, black, Muslim, hijab-wearing, immigrant woman. Wow, intersectionality is working for her. 
We know these people are part of systems that have historically been disturbingly motivated to silence, discredit, and dehumanize influencers who threaten the establishment. End quote. Boy, that sounds almost like CARE's mission statement. So again, according to Omar, the fault doesn't lie with her, even though she was caught red-handed and forced to pay the money back. The fault was in the whistleblowers who were out to get her because she's a Muslim woman. Now, have you heard any of this? Now, barely a peep in even local media, practically nothing from the mainstream media. But that's not the half of it. The more troubling stuff about Congresswoman Omar and the perfect example of what I'm talking about is happening next weekend. And the media? Relatively silent. We pick up there next. Remember those days where you just had to be, uh, you know, concerned about the typical physical crimes, like you had to have a security system, maybe a firearm, something to protect your home and your family, and that was about it. You didn't have to worry about anything really about like identity theft. What, what is that? Well, we're now in the point of a point of our history where that's a very big concern. Everybody knows now about identity theft, but not everybody knows about home title fraud. It's still one of the fastest growing crimes in America, whether you know about it or not. So you better protect yourself. If you have a mortgage or a refi or a HELOC through a major bank, uh, you may be at risk of losing every dollar of your equity that you've built up in your home and possibly your home itself. This is one of the scariest things about this because the people who get hit hardest by home title fraud are the people who did it right. The people who saved their money and put it into their mortgage and paid their mortgage down. Those are the people with equity, and those are the people who are targets to criminals across the world who actually go after these titles. Uh, it is a scary thing that's going on right now, but you can protect yourself. If you just go with home title lock, um, they can take out loans against your equity. That's a bad thing. You want to stop that. Your bank can't protect you from this, and neither does an insurance or identity theft programs. But for pennies a day, home title lock does. They put a virtual barrier around your home's title. Check now to see if you're already a victim. Go to HomeTitleLock.com and register for your free title scan and report. It's $100 value free when you sign up at HomeTitleLock.com. It's HomeTitleLock.com. I want you to give this um, to any reasonable Democrat that you know, because I don't think Democrats hate the country. Um, some do, you know, but so do some people on the right, I guess. Um, we all are in this together. And ask them, if you believe the information surrounding President Trump's dealings with Russia are enough to warrant an investigation, imagine a scenario like this. Let's say word leaked out that actual Russian spies set up a propaganda and fundraising network here in the United States and used it to spread lies and advocate for Russian interests and bilk us of millions of dollars and give it to rebels. Then that organization got busted for it, outed in federal court, but despite that, President Trump would continue to use their information and actively fundraise for them here in the United States. I, I, I think you'd be out of your mind with rage. I know I would be. I'd be standing with everybody else who like, uh, this has got to stop. I'm going to show you that's exactly what is happening with Congresswoman Omar. She is engaging in exactly the same thing. Exactly. I mentioned last week that Omar would be in Los Angeles to give the keynote uh, address for the fundraiser for CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. As usual for Omar, the media just goes, oh yeah, okay, big deal. And oh boy, you know, big deal, it's CARE. Well, let me give you a quick refresher on who CARE actually is. This is the actual court case from the United States of America versus the Holy Land Foundation. This case is so important because what it revealed was, for the first time, an elaborate scheme launched by the Muslim Brotherhood to tip American sentiment towards the Palestinians, tip it in policy, in sentiment, and to raise money to support Hamas. They were officially designated a foreign terrorist organization. Now, 
If anyone doubts whether the Muslim Brotherhood had a role in the creation of Hamas, or if they advocated for violence, you don't have to look any further than this. This is the official Hamas charter. Article 2 states, and if I may quote, the Islamic resistance movement, that's Hamas, is one of the wings of the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. The Muslim Brotherhood movement is a world organization, the largest Islamic movement in the modern era, end quote. Okay, so Muslim Brotherhood was involved, but it's a peace movement, you would say. Well, I'm sure it says it someplace in the charter. In fact, oh yeah, here it is in Article 13. And again, I quote, peace initiatives. The so-called peace solutions and all international conferences to resolve the Palestinian problem are all contrary to the beliefs of the Islamic resistance movement. Next page. There is no solution to the Palestinian problem except by jihad. All right. So the Muslim Brotherhood created Hamas very specifically to destroy Israel, but they also created Hamas support groups all over the world. So Hamas is in Palestine, then you have the Muslim Brotherhood up, up here, and this support group all over the world provided streams of cash to support their fighters. But it also worked to try to influence other countries to change their policies on Israel and support Hamas. The Muslim Brotherhood quickly moved into the United States and they set up one of these networks. And let me show you. Here's the Muslim Brotherhood. Here's Palestine. They set up Hamas. Then all over the world and here in the United States, they put the Palestinian uh, or Palestine Committee together. The Palestine Committee was broken up into three parts. The United Association for Studies and Research, that's a think tank. The Islamic Association of Palestine, that's in charge of pop propaganda. And the Holy Land Foundation, that's the fund. They were in charge of procuring and funneling money back to Hamas terrorists in Palestine. These three people are this. Okay, these three people came down here and they created the propaganda arm of CARE. CARE was created as a tool for the Islamic Association of Palestine by those three men, Nihad Awad, Omar Ahmad, and Rafiq Jabbar. Now, Awad and Ahmad, these, these two, all right, were both caught via FBI wiretap at an infamous Philly meeting. This is where law enforcement were able to verify that the Palestinian committee, the US-based Muslim Brotherhood, was discussing how they were going to continue to support Hamas. I want you to remember this man's face. It's very important. Now, the official court document that was annotating who was at the media, at the media, the meeting, in Philly is right here. Both of these men attended. Both of these men were key speakers. Ahmad was the person that actually set up the meeting and led the opening remarks. These are the founders of CARE. It is absolutely indisputable. CARE is Hamas. Nihad Awad continues to lead CARE to this day. This is who Omar is funding, fundraising for next week. The propaganda arm for the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. Now how is it nobody is interested in this? How come no one is pointing this out? The question that we have to ask ourselves, if all of that is true, which it is and verifiable, please do your own homework. Congresswoman Omar, is she ignorant of CARE's true identity or is she a willing accomplice? Well, we have to go back to where she was born. She was born in Somalia, Mogadishu, in 1981. Then, because of this horrible civil war in Somalia, she had to leave in 1992. She went to Kenya. In 1995, she was approved as a refugee, and she settled in Virginia and then quickly moved to Minnesota. In 2011, she graduated from the Humphrey School of Political Science and International Studies. Okay, while she was there... The Humphrey School is um, a place that has, the CARE has their tentacles all over this Humphrey School of Public Affairs. So when Amar was at Humphrey, 
This was the type of conferences being held there, Islam in the West, with the goal of, quote, pursuing development and enhancing understanding between Muslims and Western worlds. Okay, not bad. This event was co-sponsored, of course, by the Minnesota chapter for the Council on American-Islamic Relations. Remember, also known as Hamas, the propaganda arm. Last summer, Kerr was at the Humphrey School leading a challenging Islamophobia conference. Now, was it during this time when she was at the University of Minnesota that Omar got mixed up with the Hamas front group? We don't know. But we do know this. She is now fundraising for CARE next week. And it has been reported on recently that she has been fundraising for them for years. This is a CARE Minnesota advertisement for a fundraiser back in 2017. One of the noted speakers was the then state representative, Ilan Amar. But still useful idiot or is she a willing accomplice well it's one thing to show up for a few events for care at her school or for some random fundraiser but it's not like she actually worked for care right well let's take a quick peek at her resume displayed full view on her own website look at the top under community leader former advisory board member for minnesota council on american islamic uh, relations so we have a sitting member of Congress who raises money for and used to work with an organization with direct ties to the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas, a U.S. designated terror group. Now, as I said, CARE was founded as a propaganda arm for Hamas. So what if we found evidence that she was parroting the same kind of propaganda from the halls of Congress that, that CARE is, is, is putting out? Would that be grounds for at least a little intention? So Omar has gotten in trouble lately for making anti-Semitic comments. And the one that she really popped her head out with was uh, in February. She said that the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC, was controlling U.S. foreign policy. The outcry from both the Republicans and the Democrats eventually had her retract that. But she seemingly has made going after APAC somewhat of her own personal jihad. Now, isn't it interesting that if you go to CARE and you look at their press releases, the main target of CARE is APAC. They, they attack almost nonstop. These are just 15 of the unbelievable, uncount, uh, unaccounted uh, things that CARE has published on APAC. Now, I'd like to point out that APAC does spend a lot on lobbying, but they do not give a single dime directly to politicians. But CARE does. Now, if there was evidence that CARE was giving money to Congresswoman Omar, in light of her criticism of APAC, that would be a little embarrassing, wouldn't it? Oh, it is a little embarrassing, isn't it? So is she a hypocrite or is she spreading propaganda is it exactly as she's being told to spread? Omar's anti-Semitism is dividing the Democratic Party. Even Rahm Emanuel is writing condemnations for Omar's actions and saying, what are we doing? The divide against amongst the Democrats eventually led to a formal House vote to condemn anti-Semitism. But what they ended up passing was a blanket resolution condemning all hateful language. So in other words, yeah, 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 what Omar said was bad and anti-Semitic, but we're not going to call her out by name, and instead, we implore people just to talk nicely to each other in general. It was ridiculous. But how can, how can the Democrats not be in agreement to chastise Omar and condemn anti-Semitism? Did some outside lobbying group, known for propaganda, pressure Democrats to leave Omar alone and water down the anti-Semitist talk? Well, here's a photo taken at the Capitol just before the House vote. The man standing next to Linda Sarsour is Nihad Awad, the same man that was the head of and founding member of CARE and directly identified by the FBI as one of the Palestinian committee members supporting Hamas. All right, I want you to be really, really careful about data breaches. Uh, there was a data breach that just exposed 24 million people to title fraud, and that one could cost your home. I can't believe that more people don't know about title fraud. I'll tell you how to find out if you're already a victim. But if you have a mortgage, a refi, anything, 
you may be at risk of losing every single dollar of ed- equity that you built up in your home and possibly your home. This is people have, have lost their homes to this and it's taken them years to untangle it. What they do is they go and they, they actually transfer the title. It's really quite simple to do. Thieves go in, they transfer the title to some bogus name that they happen to have an ID on, and then they go to a bank, use your, your house as lateral, and then stick you with the payments while they go off with the cash. This is what happens, and only one, one group can take care of it. It's HomeTitleLock.com. Hey, for uh, all you heathens out there who may not know this, Easter is just around the corner, and I have the perfect gift idea for you. Wonder Bible. It is a gift that will teach your children and your grandchildren the Bible and biblical principles, which used to be the foundation of our country. Not so much anymore, but we need to get back to that. Our kids and grandkids are the future, of course, helping them understand what made this country what it was and what it can be again is critical to their future, our future, the future of their children. You know, 80% of Bibles sold are given as a gift. So is there a better time to get them a Wonder Bible than Easter? Wonder Bible, as you can see, it is a handheld audio Bible that is great for those from young to old, people of all ages, to hear the powerful words of the Bible anywhere at any time. It is small enough to fit in your pocket. Uh, It also comes with a rechargeable lithium battery and it lasts up to 10 hours on a single charge. That is a long time. That's longer than like any of my son's toys. Buy one Wonder Bible right now for $39.99. Get an optional second Wonder Bible for 50% off with free shipping and handling. To order your Wonder Bible, you can call 1-800-558-6993 or visit online at wonderbible.com. If you don't want your children going on your smartphones, getting access to potentially dangerous content, but you want them to read the good word, this is a great way, wonderbible.com. You know what I find interesting is on my chalkboard at Fox, I told you that the left and the Islamic... um, uh, rebels would work together in the end. I'm going to cover that in the next show, the news and why it matters. Thanks so much for watching.